Big power begins with race ready parts. And today our diesel Denali gets machined, then built. Plus, simple customizing tips to make your truck stand out from the crowd. Voila. You guys probably remember Dragon Alley. It's our 2011 GMC Sierra Denali HD, and based on the amount of parts we have in the bed, you probably guessed that we've torn it down. A couple of weeks ago, it was driving under its own power with this under the hood, a 6.6 .6 liter LML Duramax V8. Now, we do have some pretty high power goals for this truck, and the stock parts that were inside just won't hold up, so we had to take it apart. Best part about this is, though, we'll still get to use the stock block to rebuild it. We stripped it down, went through it, all the sill in the walls are in great condition. There's nothing even remotely wrong with this block besides it being a little grungy and a little dirty. Get it cleaned up, we'll be in business. It all comes down to this right here, the stock piston and connecting rod. Now, this does look fairly sturdy, especially when you compare it side by side to one that came out of a small block Chevy. However, a diesel engine, especially when you hop it up with bigger injectors, bigger injection pump, and massive turbos, can put so much heat and cylinder pressure inside, the stock pistons would crack or even melt, and the connecting rods, well, they'd look like a banana. So we had to take it all apart and start over. Then you look at this crank and you think, well, that's not a problem at all. And it wouldn't be if we were only going, I hope I don't fold my foot, to about six or 700 horse. But we plan on going way north of that, and this would honestly shatter in a million pieces and we'd be starting all over with a brand new block. So we picked up an entirely new rotating assembly, but we can't just drop it into this block first. There are a few machining processes that we have to do first. So let's load up our parts and hit the road. Off the machine shop. Buddy. I don't think even if I had a cylinder hone, you know, free reign of the shop. Someone said, all right, go ahead, you know, do the machine work on your engine. I, I honestly wouldn't know where to start. So. No, I bet if I throw you a book, you'd have it figured out by the end of the day. <laughs> Our buddies at Shacklet Auto Machine are just up the road in Nashville. They have the proper equipment and skills to prepare our LML short block for final assembly. Let's get this thing out of the rain. Here at Shacklet Automotive Machine, we're a full service machine shop. We specialize in any automotive internal engine machining, uh, crankshaft balancing, block work, head work, crank grinding, crank balancing. Uh, we do a little bit of import domestic diesel, light duty diesel. Uh, we can pretty much do any of your machining needs. So we brought you a factory block and we brought you a whole bunch of new parts for the rotating assembly. What are some of the steps that you're gonna have to do so we can assemble all of our parts together? So we're gonna start with the housing board. We're we'll putting the ARP fasteners in and we're gonna align hone it to achieve the proper size and diameter. Uh, the cylinders, will hone those to accommodate the new pistons you guys supplied. And on the rotating assembly, we'll balance it uh, completely with all the new components. What would happen if we tried to put this thing together without going through the proper machine steps? So if you started to put this engine together without having the housing board checked, it's a very good possibility the housing board would be the improper size, causing bearing failure or the crank not to spin at all. You guys are going to have an engine that's going to be completely machined, new cam bearings, the cylinders finished, the rotating assembly will be balanced, everything will be checked. to be ready for you guys to assemble. Uh, everything should go together smoothly for you. What do you think of taking a big, giant, heavy truck with a diesel engine that's designed for working and trying to make that fast. Like, you think we're crazy or what? No, I think it's a cool concept. Uh, we've, we've done some of this in the past with other customers and it's uh, the finished result is very interesting. So it's gonna be a hot minute before we get that engine back from the machine shop. And that just means we got time to add a little more pizzazz to this old girl. Now already smoked out in rear tail lights and probably gonna add some LEDs or smoke to the front. Since I'm up here, well you guessed it, we slap it on some cab lights. Now I know, it's a love it or hate it thing, this single rear wheel, and you're probably saying, well, hey, they only belong on a dually. You might be right, but there's really no rules. So before we really get cranking on the top, we gotta get down there, undo a few bolts, and drop that headliner, because, well, we'll be passing a drill bit clean through this sheet metal, and don't want to see it from the inside. Pull it down enough, shove a little, little guy in there to hold it. Works for me. With the engine back, time to get to work.
We've got our Duramax block back from the machine shop. It's freshly honed, line honed, and they threw in some new cam bearings and stuck it in the jet washer. But the rest of the cleanup, well, that's on us. And the deck surface is one of the most important things that you want to make sure is clean and flat. Now, a lot of guys are tempted to go out and grab an angle grinder with a scotch bright pad on the back of it. Now, this will make the deck surface nice and shiny, and it removes a lot more material than people give it credit for. So, you do not want to use this on a deck surface. You can use it on the back of the block to get some rust off the bell housing flange or anything like that. But for a deck, I like to use a flat piece of aluminum and some 180 grit sticky back sandpaper. Spray the deck surface with WD-40 and just kind of go to town flat to make sure that this deck surface gets nice and clean. That way the head gasket will seal and there's no chance your combustion pressure is going to escape. From there, I grabbed a wire wheel and I cleaned up some of the rust, the loose dirt and paint off the side of the block and I wiped everything down with lacquer thinner to make sure there's no residual oil left. Now, a fresh coat of paint is really not going to make your engine perform any better, but it does make it look better and that's where we're going to start. I'm using regular old masking tape to keep the deck surfaces nice and clean since I spent so much time preparing them earlier. And once the tape is laid down, a sharp razor blade makes for a nice clean edge. Once everything's protected, I'm throwing down some high temp engine paint and the color I chose is Black Pearl. I took some time earlier to clean and paint all the cast aluminum accessories that are going to seal up the outside of our LML Duramax. But before I bolt any of this on, I've got to bolt all of this in. Now, the rotating assembly that you choose for your engine is kind of important because these are the parts that support the amount of horsepower that you'd like to make. Now, we have a goal of somewhere around a thousand horsepower. I don't know if we're going to make it, but on paper we've got the fuel and we've got the air to get us there. So we're going to do our best. But none of the stock parts from the rotating assembly are going to withstand that much power. So we went to Summit Racing and we picked up a completely new bottom end. And it all starts with this guy right here. This is a Cali's 4340 Ford steel crankshaft. Now this thing is much, much stronger than the stock crank. As far as pistons are concerned, you might be expecting us to go with a forged piston, but they're really not going to give us much longevity on the street. So instead, we've got a Mala cast piston. This is actually a steel ring land that's cast inside an aluminum piston. These will hold up to a thousand horsepower and they're much more durable for long-term street use. As far as connecting rods are concerned, well, these will do way more than we're going to ask of them. These are Oliver forged I-beam connecting rods. And the very last thing we got is a new set of bearings. And before we bolt any of these parts in, I've got to check the main bearing clearance over at the block. So checking bearing clearance is a very important step, but it requires some tools that measure very precisely down to the 10 thousandths of an inch. And I don't have those tools, so we're gonna borrow Pat's. All right, so you're all torqued up, ready to go? Yeah, she's all set. Here's the crank, um, and I don't know what to do from here, so. Well, first thing we do, we have to measure the crank to make sure we set our gauge right so we can measure that hole properly. So what we're gonna do, get our mic out, and we're gonna mic a journal. So we're gonna go on here, very carefully measure. And I'll just take it around and put it on each journal. And if it feels the same, they're the same size. Now, when we're, we're micing it for size, now we're not micing it for roundness or anything like that because it's a new crank. Right. They're very accurate. This is a very accurate crankshaft. I already tell by the first three that I've done. So basically what you're doing is you're measuring the exact size of the, the crankshaft. Then you're going to calibrate your other tool, which is called a what? Uh, that's a dial bore gauge. So you're going to calibrate the dial bore gauge to that exact size. And what are we shooting for in terms of like clearance? Because we need a, you got a rule of thumb, right? What's your rule of thumb? Rule of thumb on race engines is one thousandths of clearance per inch of shaft diameter. Now we have over a three inch main journal. So that it means we need a minimum of three thousandths of vertical oil clearance for the thing to live at a big power level. And I'm led to believe this is going to be a big power level. Hey, you never know what will happen, right? We've got some lofty <laughs> ambitions. That's all I'm going to say. Okay, so I have a measurement now on the micrometer, and this is three 
146.4. Okay. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna set this dial bore gauge to exactly what this is, and then what that will be is a direct reference from the journal size, when we put this in and measure inside the actual housing with the bearing torqued in, it will be a direct measurement. So I know I've seen this part before. Right, I mean, this is pretty common. Doesn't matter if it's diesel gas, and everything being correct, these will all be equal. Yeah, that's really nice right there. Second one, three, 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 four. The line hone on this is extremely accurate. Three, five, three, four, three, five. All right, you're good to go. The crank is accurate, the line hone, the bearings, everything is great. Come get me when you need to do the rods because it needs to be done. Thought he was at least gonna put it together for me. That's actually my job, and I'll take you through it next. Now, for you weary fellas out there, you might be a little concerned about drilling holes in the roof. But not to worry, how do you think the factory puts cab lights up there? It's just metal. If it's drilled and sealed properly, you'll never have a leak. And with these cab lights from Summit Racing, they'll already come with a weather strip backing on them. And that'll ensure a proper seal. But just to add a little extra precaution, we're going to clean it real good, add some of the right stuff, Permatex gasket maker, and well, we'll never have a problem. Just about every piston kit that you buy will come with a set of rings that require some fine tuning on the gap. Now, depending on your application, whether it's naturally aspirated or forced induction, or even if the engine runs on gas or diesel, well, that gap will be different. So they leave you enough room to work with them all. For this application, we're looking for about 24 thousandths of an inch. And right now, it's much too tight. So we've got some work to do to correct that. There are many tools you could use to fine tune the ring gap, like a whetstone, a diamond sharpening card, or even sandpaper. And they'll all do the job just the same, but it is much more efficient to use a dedicated grinder. Ours has a fixture the ring clamps into, and it uses a dial indicator, which allows you to quickly and accurately dial in the gap. If you're doing this for the first time, just remember to take it slow, and don't try to nail it the first time around. You'll have to put the ring in the bore once or twice to check progress and just sneak up on the finished size. Also remember, the top and second ring have different specs, so adjust your methods accordingly. So one thing to keep in mind when you're assembling your pistons, connecting rods, and your rings all together is positioning is important because there's a very specific way each of these parts has to go together. First thing you want to pay attention to on the bottom of the piston is there's a hole for the oil squirter. Now this thing bolts to the block and it kind of lines up right in that little groove. So the orientation of the piston is important and they help you out with a little mark that's imprinted on the top of each piston. This goes towards the center of the valley. Now the same thing holds true on the connecting rod. On one side, there's a heavy chamfer that's ground into the bearing surface. On the other side, it's flat. Now the reason for this is because when you have a pair of connecting rods that are mated together on the same journal, the chamfers go out to mate with the radius of the crankshaft. And finally, the rings. Now, you can spin these things 360 degrees around on the top of the piston, but there's a very specific orientation that the gaps have to be staggered at. Now, there's a chart that's included that'll show you where to put it if you're not sure. So the first thing we gotta do is load this piston up with some rings. The first thing to go on the piston is the oil spring, followed by the oil scraper. Then the second ring, followed by the top. Next, I'll install the first snap ring and clean the small end of the connecting rod. With a chamfer on the correct side, I'll lubricate and install the wrist pin. It gets held into place with the other snap ring, and now all you gotta do is repeat the process seven more times. Over at the block, the main bearings get a coat of assembly lube to help keep things protected on initial fire up. Coming through, you Kimasami. And the crank is carefully lowered into place with some assistance. Nice and easy. Right, touch down. All right, perfect fit. I love it. All right there, Hoopty. You don't need me anymore. You're just going to throw some caps on, torque them down, and move on, huh? Yeah, a few more steps to go, and this thing will be running before you know it. 
Sweet, almost got the cab lights wired up, so be in business. All right, where's my torque wrench? The other half of the bearing is lubed, the main caps are tapped into place, and the studs are threaded into the block. The strength of the fastener that you choose and the level that it is torqued to play a huge role in the strength of your bottom end. Because basically, when this thing is running, you don't want any of these parts moving around at all. That's why we're using ARP fasteners. Now, the final torque value is going to be 175 pound feet on the main studs and 90 pound feet on the side bolts. And we're going to get there in three equal steps. With the main and side bolts tight, the last thing to check on the crankshaft is end play, and ours measures in at five thousandths. Back at the table, the rod bearing gets assembly lube, and the piston rings get hit with some engine braking oil. And then I'll slide over a tapered ring compressor. The rod is slid down into the cylinder until the ring compressor sits flat on the deck and a few gentle taps from a hammer will push the piston into the bore until the rod bearing makes contact with the crank. The cap goes on, and the bolts are threaded in. And the process is repeated until all eight are installed. Badges? We don't need no stinking badges. One step I always take after installing each piston and rod assembly is to crank the motor over a couple of times just to make sure there's nothing bound up. You can fix any problems you have right away. Now, this thing spins over perfectly and the rotating assembly is pretty much done. Now, I still do need to torque the caps for the rods, but I'm going to wait until I get the camshaft and lifters in just so I don't have to flip the motor over a hundred times. It'll just save me a few steps. Now, as far as the camshaft upgrade is concerned, a lot of people don't think of it as a first modification when you're building a diesel engine. But when you're chasing really high power levels, it's just as important as it is as upgrading cam in a gasoline engine. Now, we picked up this Hamilton cam from Summit Racing, and it measures in at 192 degrees degrees of duration at 50,000 lift on the intake side and 200 degrees on the exhaust. Now this will do a couple different things for us. Number one, it will reduce the spool up time of the turbochargers. Number two, of course it's going to add horsepower and number three, it's going to reduce the exhaust gas temperature in the engine because it gets more air into and out of the cylinders. Once the cam gear is in place and the bolt is torqued to spec, the lifters also get a coat of assembly lube and slide down into the bores. They're held into place by a retaining plate and a hold down clamp, which finishes up the bottom end of our LML Duramax. Now obviously it's not wired up permanently, and once we got all the wiring harnesses and the truck put back together, I'll tap into the park lights, that way when you're running lights or park lights, they'll come on with everything else. But in the meantime, I just wanted to show you what it looked like. Now, I still have another thing or two to do that'll clean up the outside of this truck and make it look sharp. In order to safely make the most amount of power you can from a diesel engine, extra airflow is the name of the game. Now, normally you'll take care of that with things like larger turbochargers, freer flowing exhaust manifolds, a bigger intercooler, and stuff like that. But you can't forget about the cylinder heads either. Now, we're going to be installing a set of Edelbrock Performer RPM heads onto our LML. Now, these things flow a lot more air than our stock heads, and they come ready to assemble right out of the box. So, the first thing that we're going to do is transfer all the old parts from our original head onto the new ones. Just as important as the strength of the stud is the method of torquing, and it's critical to apply lubricant like ARP Ultra Torque on the threads of the stud so the most accurate clamp load is applied to the fastener as the nut is turned. With the head gasket in place on the right side of the engine, I'll install two studs to help guide our Edelbrock cylinder heads carefully onto the block. Then the remaining studs are dropped into place and threaded down and the washers and nuts also get a coat of ultra torque. The final torque specs for the 625 head studs is 150 pound feet, but I'll get there in three equal steps. Now I know a lot of you would want to black this truck completely out and I can't say I blame you, but we already got some polished 22s and after all it's a Denali. So this Denali HD lettering, that's staying. These chrome door handles, that's gonna stay. 
With this big old chunky rub rail, when we're ripping that off, we'll clean the side of this truck way up. There's also a Z71 sticker in the back. Be badge it, clean that off as well. Now, if you ask me, it's gonna be pretty slick looking. Hey, brother, looks like you got that looking like a complete engine, huh? Yeah, the long box pretty much done. Got the whole valve train in, valve lash is set, push rods are in, basically ready to run. Slap a few injectors in, call it a day. Yeah, you know, we picked these up from Summit Racing, and they're made by Dynamite Diesel Products, and they'll flow enough fuel to support 1,000 horsepower. That's kind of that magic number we're shooting Hope for. Hope so, man. But the other cool thing is these have been balanced to within 2% of each other, so we'll have a nice smooth running engine. Each cylinder will be contributing exactly the same amount of power, even though we're making a ton of it. That big old 67 looks beautiful sitting in the valley, too. Yeah, and then we'll get that 485 off to the side. I just can't wait to feel this thing spooling up. But um, the truck, though, it looks great. Way shinier than it was before. Yeah, I didn't realize how bad the paint was until I started polishing out where the uh, rub rails were, and I just got carried away. Couldn't help it. All right, well, we still got some work ahead of us, and if you guys have any questions about anything you've seen on the show today or you want Austin to polish your truck, be sure to check us out at PowerNationTV.com. Thanks for watching. Catch us next week. So how many hours are we going to finish the rest of this?